Hello and welcome to chapter six. In chapter six, we're going to be talking about strategy analysis and choice. Now our learning objectives, we're going to talk about what is strategy analysis and how do, do companies choose the right strategies for the company? And we talk about a couple of different exercises or frameworks that companies can use to help them better understand where they fit in in the industry and how they can achieve their strategies. <clears throat> so we have things like the SWOT analysis, the space matrix, um, we have the BCG matrix. So these are just different corporate constructs made up to help businesses better organize their ideas and, and formulate a strategy and take action on how to you know, achieve their sales growth, grow, um, goals, their profit goals, how to eliminate costs, <clears throat> how to better organize the company's culture and behavior and identify um, you know, the value of the different strategic choices they might determine. So in this particular um, progress of our course, we're now moving into um, uh, this stage, uh, strategy analysis and choice, which is the same name of the chapter, of course, uh, and then so first up, let's talk about the process of generating and selecting a strategy. So this is a big deal for a company because this is really going to lay out what the company is going to be doing for the next one to five years. And it has to be a strategy that's going to align with the strategic mission and the mission statement. Um, it has to be something that's achievable from management that's going to satisfy the stakeholders of the company. And in the process of generating the strategy, of course, companies have to look at, you know, their strengths or weaknesses, the advantages, the disadvantages of particular strategies, you know, what are the trade-offs they're going to be making uh, based on what strategies they choose and the benefits of these strategies, um, you know, as far as they're going to contribute to the bottom line of the company. All this is sort of the getting started process. Now, the first step would really be for a company to write down all the all the different strategies that they could be involved with or they should be involved with. So, you know, the management team of the company should get together with their stakeholders, specifically, um, you know, the employees and think about how the organizational vision and mission statements are going to lead to uh, a decision on what strategic direction the company should go to go in. Of course, you know, when we discussed the external audit, the internal audit uh, in previous chapters. This all goes into that knowledge bank that the company is going to draw from to help make these strategic decisions. Now, Different people participating in the process, of course, will have their own ideas. And this is where these different alternative strategies are gonna be proposed by key players of the company. Everything should be discussed, considered. In some cases, some, are, some different strategies could be merged together. Um, they could be, they should be written out in, in somehow in a list or organized in a way to keep track of all the suggestions. Because not all the strategies, of course, can be followed. Um, but it's important to have everything out on the table and identify these key strategies um, and have the people who are participating in the strategic process be given a chance to explain their concerns, their strategies, and kind of at a certain point, everybody should sort of have a ranking method of the different strategies laid out to sort of give it an importance, a level of importance for each strategy. Um, Okay, so here is the strategy formulation analytical flame, uh, framework. So stage one is three stages, the input stage, the matching stage, and the decision stage. So the input stage is really, we're looking to collect our um, competitor profile, our competitors, what are they, where are they, what are they doing, our internal evaluation, which we talked more about in a previous chapter, and the external 
evaluation, which we talked about in the previous channel, so, chapter. So these are the inputs. What's the industry doing? What are our competitors doing? What is our internal situation? And what is the external situation outside of the company? So these are all the inputs that we're going to start with. And then we have various matrix. Of course, not all companies are going to use these different matrix, but the SWOT analysis, the space, the BCG, the IE, the grand strategy matrix, these are all different tools companies can use to help select the strategy. And then finally is going to be the decision stage and the planning stage of what strategies we're going to choose and how we're going to implement them. Okay, so let's talk more about the input stage. So first, we have to summarize the basic inputs um, that we're going to need to formulate any strategy. So there are different matrix that we can utilize to help us gather this information. Uh, so we have a better idea of where the company is within itself and within the industry. Now, in the matching stage, uh, this is where we're going to start generating specific strategies. And hopefully these are going to match um, the external internal strengths and weaknesses and the competitive landscape. So and again, we have a series of different tools, like a SWOT analysis, the, the space matrix, the BCG matrix that we can utilize to help with this matching stage. And of course, we're going to talk more about these as the chapter unfolds. Uh, in step three, uh, like I said before, the decision stage. So we have to um, quantify. In step two, we're more qualifying, but in step three, we're more quantifying the decisions and the strategic plan. And, you know, hopefully this will, in the decision stage, a clear a winner will emerge from the different strategies. That will be the uh, objectively best strategy for where the company is trying to go. Okay, so let's talk about the SWOT analysis. Very common analysis that I think most companies utilize in one form or, or another. And it's pretty simple. We want to list our, in four quadrants, we want to list our strengths and opportunities. We want to list our weaknesses and opportunities these weaknesses may present, to correct them, of course. Strengths and threats, uh, weaknesses and threats. So this is sort of just... Make, so the SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So we want to kind of start out by listing all the strengths, listing all the weaknesses, listing all the opportunities, listing the threats, and then, then sort of combining them by strengths and opportunities, weaknesses and opportunities, strengths and threats, weaknesses and threats. There's different ways that we can combine this basic uh, information. So uh, strengths and opportunities. Of course, this is a critical area where we can use our internal strengths to take care to take advantage of external opportunities so maybe we're very strong in creative um, packaging design uh, of products and then externally uh, a new field of product opens up that uh, competitors are making but they're not doing it well but we have our competitive advantages and actually creating a finished product that is aesthetically pleasing and and durable or how you know now, weaknesses and opportunities, this is where we want to, you know, look to see what we need to improve. What's an internal weakness that we can improve by taking care of an external opportunity? So maybe a, a weakness of ours might be in the skill set of our um, research team. Maybe we don't have enough skilled researchers or enough researchers with the most current education. An external opportunity could be pairing with a university that's producing graduates and creating an internship program or a hiring program to get more of these people on board of the company. Now, um, strengths and threats. This is where we want to use the strength of the firm to avoid or reduce the impact of external threats. So maybe external threats could be new competitors. <clears throat> so if our company is large enough, we can use the economies of scale to make sure that um, any new people coming into the marketplace really would not be able to compete with us on a profit level. So it takes somebody with really deep pockets to move into the industry. Now, weaknesses and threats, this would be more of a defensive tactic we can take to, re to reduce uh, internal weakness and avoid external threats. So <clears throat> if we have a weakness, maybe it's our manufacturing centers located in a very expensive um, 
area where labor costs are high and material costs are expensive to have shipped, <clears throat> we might be able to take advantage of moving, um, moving this to another a location that would have provide lower labor costs, lower shipping costs, um, and avoid the threat of being um, getting into a pricing war we can't win. Okay. So here's an example of uh, a SWOT analysis. This slide up a little bit. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so here we have our, our, so this is for a retail computer store. I think like Circuit City, which is out of business. They probably could have really used this or Best Buy. There's really not a lot of single standing um, computer stores anymore. There used to be like a gateway, used to have a, used to be a gateway computers, used to have stores. Um, but now, you know, these stores are a lot more mixed with a, with a better product mix. And I think that was one of the things that came out of, you know, <clears throat> especially companies that started out selling a lot of computers, realizing that they need to rely on other components as well. So in this particular uh, retail, they have their opportunities as far as, you know, the growth of the business, the, um, the, the growth of, you know, here talking about population growth. Uh, uh, there's only, there's a computer store opening a mile away. There's just a couple of different things that leave specific to this retail store. And then the threats, strengths, and then they start mixing the uh, strengths and opportunities, strengths and threats. So you can kind of see how they're just, just a paper layout of their strategies to take advantage of these four components, opportunities, threats, strengths, and weaknesses, and then looking at the strategies to kind of help move the company forward in that phase. So that's a decent example. Now, so the SWOT uh, matrix, of course, we're gonna list all the key external opportunities, external threat, internal strengths, internal weaknesses. And then we're gonna try to match the internal strengths with external opportunities. Um, and you know record these strategies just like we showed in the previous slide and then of course like i was talking before match the internal weaknesses with external opportunities like our, our weaknesses in certain staffing areas and then partnering with the university close close by maybe a few miles away matching internal strength with um, external threats how can our strengths help to compensate for these threats and matching internal weaknesses with um, external threats and to figure out a way to reduce this combination of, a, of, of an internal weakness and an external threat. What, what could be done? Maybe it's buying another company to fill a particular void that we're missing. Maybe we're looking to be more vertically integrated and we're going to buy another retailer or buy a wholesaler or buy a manufacturer, you know, to kind of fill the, fill that gap of that's missing that other companies or the competitors may have. Um, and again, now let's move into the space matrix. So in the space matrix, we have this, you know, sort of these y, X and Y axis. And, you know, we're going to, uh, well, first of all, what does space stand for? It's strategic positioning and action evaluation um, is what the space stands for. And it's sort of a stage two in match, of a matching tool that uses to the two axes in four quadrants to reveal whether aggressive, conservative, or defensive uh, competitive strategies are appropriate for given situation. So we look at, you know, aggressive strategy, I'm sorry, aggressive strategies, conservative, defensive, uh, competitive. Many of these that we talked about uh, last in the last um, chapter. So it's, it's really trying to figure out what position do we want to be in? <clears throat> and there's like, they represent two internal uh, dimensions, the financial position and the competitive position and two external dimensions, the stability position and the internal, I'm sorry, the industry position. So let me just advance this slide. This is basically what I already talked about. It's a four quadrant framework, but this is visually shows it a lot better here. And then um, which extent, which, where, which posture should we take as a company? And again, like I was saying before, there's the two dimensions, financial position and competitive position, as well as the stability position and the industry position. 
Now, let's just back up for a second. I just want to talk about, so if we're conservative, we're looking at, you know, market penetration, market development, product development, related diversification. So this is a more conservative, um, here's my cat again, more conservative way um, forward. <clears throat> now, a more aggressive way would be to do some sort of a, uh, integration of the business um, where, where, you know, growing, growing the, whether it's vertical or horizontal integration, we're looking to aggressively uh, move forward. In the defensive stance, <clears throat> of course, we talked about this last chapter where we're looking to retreat, um, sell certain divisions, liquidate other assets, uh, pull back and close stores. And then in the more competitive landscape, we again would we do some more um, backwards, forwards, horizontal integration with the market penetration development and product development. So the only thing difference between the aggressive is, you know, if we're doing diversification, it's a little bit more aggressive because we're looking to move into new areas. So just different, just different themes that can fit in these different quadrants. So moving forward to where we we're getting to uh, internal strategic positioning as far as the financial position, you know, how much capital do we have? What is our, how, what is our leverage position? It means how debt, is, how in debt do we have? How much debt do we, are we utilizing? Liquidity, how much, um, how much month, current assets do we have to current liabilities? Our cash flow, our inventory turnovers, our earnings per share. So these are all our current financial position. So we kind of want to see how that's how that's going. Now, our stability position, we're looking more of what's the nature of the external influences or the industry as far as you know, is technology significantly changing our industry? What's the rate of inflation? Uh, how is demand changing? Demographics for demand. The, the, what are the prices of the competitors' products? How are they changing? Is there any, what's the barriers to entry? Is it a difficult uh, field to enter, like refining uh, gasoline, which requires huge capital investments in big refineries? Or um, what's the level of competitive pressure? Is it easy to leave the market or is it, you know, it's hard to leave a market where you already invested a huge amount of money in assets you can't sell, you know, you know, what are the risks involved in the, in the business moving forward? So this would all be looking at the stability position. Now, shh. okay, now looking at the competitive position, where we're going to think about what is our market share? What is the quality of our products? What is the product life cycle? So a product life cycle is, you know, products start out in, you know, beginning phase, a maturing phase, and then the aging phase. So as products, you know, grow old, sometimes they grow to a point where they're just going to be replaced by a new competing product or a new competing technology. Uh, how loyal are customers to our brand? So if you look at uh, some brands like Coke and Pepsi have extreme loyalty where, you know, people prefer one soda all over the other, even though they're very closely similar tasting, similar products where most people have a, have a problem even telling the difference between the two products when presented uh, a blind test uh, taste. But the loyalty is built up with such amount of heavy advertising that the loyalty helps sustain the product. Sometimes they can backfire. So when they made new Coke, they changed the taste of it and, and people were so loyal to the uh, Coke that they didn't want anything to change in the flavor that, of, the, of the product. And it was a really um, a big mess for the company how to go back to the original flavor because the loyalty was so loyal to just everything about the product. They didn't want nothing to change. Um, you know, how much technical knowledge goes into making a product and what's the level of supply over relative control over suppliers and distributors. So a company like Walmart has a huge amount of control over their suppliers. So any, any, uh, large company that's going to buy a great deal of product from any, from one supplier, you know, a classic example is Walmart would strong arm, 
um, uh, Rubbermaid as a product to the point where they knew exactly what Rubbermaid's costs were, uh, what their profits were per every product they sold to Walmart. And they got to a point where they they were so um, strong, uh, Walmart um, basically almost wanted Rubbermaid to, to provide products at single digit profit margins, which eventually at a certain point Rubbermaid had to um, just stop selling to Walmart because they couldn't afford it anymore. Because that's how strong Walmart was. They just their choice was either lower your price or we're going to stop buying from you. So they couldn't lower their price. So they Walmart stopped buying from them and Rubbermaid stopped selling to them. So this is why you need to know what supply, what control you have over suppliers and distributors. Like the soda industry has a huge amount of control over their distributors. Uh, in some cases, um, they own the, the distribution networks. And in some cases, they're owning the final destination, the shelf space. So there's, you know, the stronger control you have over your distributors, the more you can lock out other customers from using them. Other competitors, I'm sorry, from using them. Now, the industry position, position, what is the growth potential, profit potential, financial stability? Um, what is the level that leverage can be used? A resource utilization, ease of entry into the marketplace, productivity, capacity utilization. So, you know, for semiconductors, capacity utilization is a big deal. So they make these giant foundries to make that have to put out, produce millions and millions of chips to, to cover the fixed cost. So semiconductors have very high fixed costs, which means that the capacity utilization on their set, the wafer um, manufacturing facilities has to be very high in order for them to maintain profits. So that's something you should know that if they, if you're gonna get into this industry or if you're in this industry, sometimes you have no choice. You might even have to sell products at a, at a break even just to cover your fixed costs. Okay, so some steps to performing a space analysis would be selecting a set of variables to define the financial position, the competitive position, the stability position, and the industry position. So this is unique to each company. Each company needs a set. There's not one set of variables for all companies. Each company has a set of their particular group of variables that, that make are most relevant to that company. Then they have to assign a numerical value ranging from one, the worst, to seven, the best, for each variable that make up um, the FP and IP dimensions. And then negative one to negative seven, the worst for the SP and CP dimensions. Uh, and then basically you compute these average scores for these four quadrants. And then you plot these scores uh, on the appropriate axis. And by adding the two scores of the X axis and plot the results on the, the X point and the two scores to the Y axis and plot that on the Y axis, we get an intersection of this X, Y point. And, you know, we draw that directional vector. So, from the, from the origin of the space matrix through the new intersection point. And we'll show a few of these in a, in a minute. So this vector is gonna reveal the type of strategies recommended for the organization, whether it be aggressive, competitive, defensive, or conservative. Okay. So here is some of, so remember those four quadrants. So these would be more aggressive profiles when they plot the X and the Y, it makes this uh, basically this slope is directional slope and this tells us what quadrant um, we should be competing in or what strategies that we should set up um, so <clears throat> for example in this you know conservative profile a firm that suffers uh, from major competitive disadvantages in industry that is technology stable but declining in sales so you may want to have a more conservative approach where you may have one that have a more aggressive approach and a stronger when you're a stronger company in a uh, more competitive, growing, stable industry, or, you know, so these are just how, when you perform this space matrix and you get to get this positioning, which gives you a better idea of what direction the company should be to moving in. So these, again, some more example strategies from competitive and defensive strategies, financially trouble firm, very unstable industry would have a more defensive uh, position. So these are the, the, the different various outcomes. Um, Again, so here's an example of uh, a space matrix where they, they did the financial positioning, the internal, the external, and the 
uh, industry position. They came up with the scores and then they plotted the scores and developed a, a slope and they found that they should be competing in a more aggressive tone based on their X to Y positioning. <clears throat> okay, so let's move to the BGC matrix. So BGC is Boston Consulting Group. So this was a very influential uh, group, uh, a private consulting firm that was very successful, still is very successful. And they consult, they, specific, they specialize in uh, strategic planning. So this, this, this group was very influential and to kind of develop this matrix that's again, graphically gonna display the differences among divisions in terms related to the marketing, uh, the market share of the company, the market position, the industry growth rate, and have this uh, <clears throat> help to give organizations ability to manage its portfolio of businesses by examining um, their position within the industry. Um, so let me just, okay. So now this might be, once you hear this, you might find this a little bit more familiar. We have our question marks, our dogs, our cash cows, and our stars. So most people, I think, know what cash cows are. These are these steady businesses that just were milking for the money. And dogs are going to be, of course, as a more a tone of retrenchment or businesses are just not doing as well. Uh, question marks, of course, are you're a little bit unsure of where they're going. And stars are your best growth potential industries. So. This is where you basically, if you look in industry uh, sales growth rate versus relative market share position, um, this can help formulate this matrix. So let's talk about these quadrants a little bit more. So question marks, they're um, uh, say a small market share position, but they're gonna be in more of a high growth industry or more of a future high growth industry where they're gonna need a lot of cash and, and they're gonna need a lot of support. So the question marks are basically, you know, should we invest the money to really strengthen our position and get, get into uh, this market, which could have a high potential for uh, uh, future sales. And this could be, you know, <clears throat> we're just not sure if, you know, for example, Question marks for a lot of companies early on might have been streaming services. You know, is this going to be the future? Is this what we should invest in? And some companies uh, answered that question very early, invested very quickly and early in these um, in this questionable industry of streaming, which was new. And the companies that did invest early, like uh, Netflix, prospered very well. And eventually, everybody else uh, came into the streaming market and is slowly becoming turning into a stars market. So speaking of stars, this is going to be the, you know, the best long range opportunity for growth and prof profitability. This is where the market has moved. This is where the consumption has moved. This is going to be, you know, this, you have a chance for relatively high market share in a high growth industry and can re receive a significant amount of, uh, of profits from this particular group here. It's just a rising star. It's just the industry that's taking off and you're going to you know, probably want to do a lot of investment in this industry to maintain your market share, develop, you know, keep developing products and, you know, sort of what Netflix is doing. They're, they're, they're a star now and they're developing more content. They're looking to get more market penetration across the world. They're looking to cut down on people sharing passwords. So they're really, you know, refining their industry. Now, a cash cow is going to be an industry where, you know, you have relatively high market share position, but it's in a more slower growth industry. And, and it's just an industry which is, is reliable, it produces a significant amount of profit, but it's just slow growth. It's just not um, going anywhere soon. So it's a big industry, but it's not just, it's pretty saturated. It's everybody who has one, you know, has bought one already. So now it's just relying on replacements. Maybe it could be like refrigerators. So it's just a cash cow where companies can rely on it for, for steady sales and profits, but it's not gonna be a growth area of the company. Whereas the dogs are gonna be something like cigarettes maybe, where it's, the, it's, it's, it's declining market shares. 
is no growth or, or, or a declining industry. Uh, and it's just in the firm's portfolio, but it's not really making any excitement for anybody. There's not really much you could do to enhance your position here. And it's just overall going to be going away at a certain point. You know. Okay. So, okay, so this is basically a, just a recap of what I was talking about here, where the question marks are, you know, we have to decide whether we want to stay in this industry and put the money in to, to get the market penetration, develop the market, develop the products to compete in this area. We're not sure about if it's going to be a big consumer area taking off. And of course, the stars, which I talked about before, best long run opportunities and growth and profitability just, you know, and there's also going to be higher competition. If you go into a stars market, there's going to be more our firms competing than in the question mark, you know, so it's all about risk too. The cash cows, just generating a lot of cash for the company, a strong position, and the dogs where there's just something that you're eventually going to have to move away from or trim down because it's just not going to be a growth area for the company. And you shouldn't be, you know, taking too much of the company's resources away. Now we have the major benefits of the BGC matrix is that it's going to draw much more attention to the cash flows, the investments into these businesses. So how much money is going into the investments to maintain or grow the business and what's the cash flow of the business is going to eventually generate um, in the in the future and this helps to determine you know the, the value of each of these strategies and where the company is moving forward over time now here we have if we look at this particular um, uh, matrix we're looking at these different divisions, the revenue, the uh, profits, you know, and then we are trying to um, put each of these divisions one through five on the, the matrix. So division one is the star, two and three are in the questionable area. Four is a um, cash cow and five is a declining, um, a business so you can basically just see how if you had a big company you could actually put your different divisions in or, or it doesn't always have to be divisions it could be product lines it could be uh, brands um, it could be a restaurant portfolio in these different in this different matrix to see um, how they relate to your company the size the, their size compared to your company so it could be a very visual that's what's good about it it's a very visual matrix to look at uh, here's another company where we could we could look at um, their share position and the matrix and how we would uh, plot them out as far as their market share compared to industry growth. So it's very useful. And then we could sort of, um, you know, group uh, some of these products as far as some of these divisions or products as far as hold and maintain, harvest and divest, or uh, enhanced penetration development and uh, market and product development. So basically, depending on you know the the scores, we can sort of have a better idea of where to move forward with these companies. Okay, so let's move into the IE matrix. So this is another uh, matrix that uh, we can look at, and it's based on two dimensions: the IFE total weighted scores on the x-axis and the EFE total weighted scores on the y-axis. So this is also known as the internal external matrix. And it's, again, it's positions of an organizations in various uh, divisions or segments or product lines. And we could, it, it kind of works in a nine, nine cell display, which we're gonna see in a minute. And it's similar to the Boston Consulting group matrix because they both tools are going to involve plotting a firm's directions using a you know a diagram where tools um will help you know organize the uh, portfolio analysis so they're very similar concepts um you know but we have again we have the x and y axis which are different and this ie matrix is going to require more information about the divisions than the boston consultant group and so this is usually used for a bigger company, I would say, to use the IE matrix. And, you know, it helps, again, to formulate strategy 
and these nine quadrants versus four in, in the Barf's consulting group that we just looked at. So, so here are the nine quadrants. Um, and we can kind of look at the, um, this is the weighted scores and the, the, the IFE total weighted scores and the FEF total weighted scores is, is basically how they're gonna be plotted. So the scores, these are the inputs we use to calculate the scores. Um, so the, the um, two dimensions, when we talk about the IFE on the x-axis and the EFE on the y-axis, what we're talking about here is, so this is short for internal factor evaluation and this is external factor evaluation. So remember before we group things by internal and external. So this is coming up with two factor, two factors for um, the internal external um, factor evaluation. So once you have the internal, the IFE, which I'm gonna say from now on because it's shorter, um, weights, you put those on the x-axis and the EFE weight you put on the y-axis, which is the external weights. So recall that each division on the organization should be should construct an IFE matrix and an EFE matrix as part of its organization. But usually um, it's, it's, it's all tied together at, at a certain point. Um, regardless, the total weighted scores are derived from the divisions that allow construction uh, of corporate of this corporate level matrix. So the weighted score is going to represent either a weak internal position. Um, so a score of say one to two would be more of a weak internal position where a score of two to three would be more average and a score of three to four would be strong. And then on the external, we would look at a weighted score between one and two is weak, two to three is average, three to four is strong. Um, Let's see, do I have another graphic here? Okay. Oh, I'm just going back here. So again, here are the nine dimensions. So here is the low, medium, and high for each of the groups. And this is basically, you know, we're basing it off of. So if you look at division one, it has a score of 2.5. So we're going to put that over here. Uh, and then it has a score of three. So it goes into three. 2.5 here on the on the x and three on the y axis. So the so so we would populate it here between actually between quadrants four and five, uh, and that's how you would basically plot it. So we could look at these different regions where um, region region you know. So we have if we were to break it up to region one and region one would fall into cells one th uh, one two and five one two and five so this would be the region one so if we look at region two we're looking at three five and seven um three five and seven would be this diagonal and then region three would be eight nine and six and these are roman numerals V stands for five, I stands for one. So this is six. X is 10, and the numerals behind the X, in front of the X, it's a nine. So it's sort of like a track one. These are just Roman numerals, but that's how the quadrants would lay out. Quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, or regions. Um, so region one would really describe uh, growth and build. So this would be more uh, activities, strategies should focus on market penetration, market development, product development, integration, now region two, which is this diagonal here, we're looking at um, hold and maintain strategies. So we're looking just market penetration, product development, um, try to carve out and dig in our, 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 our strategies in this segment to maintain, um, to compete against the competition to maintain what we have. So we're not necessarily trying to grow or take over. We're just trying to defend and maintain what we have. But the final um, region 
down here is more of the harvest or the this or you know disinvest or deinvest. So we're looking to do here is you know okay we know these industries are going down so let's get as much money as we can let's let's you know you know get as much cash as this as well as dry sort of or maybe we just gonna divest and sell while we still have some value sell to somebody else and we'll reinvest in one of our our our, our quadrant one our region one companies or divisions okay the grand matrix so this is another so in addition to we've already talked about the swap analysis we talked about the space matrix the, the boss consultant group matrix the internal external matrix and now finally the grand strategy matrix so this is this is another very popular tool for formulating strategy so all organizations can be positioned in one grand matrix um, of four strategic quadrants so basically um, it's sort of I best describe it but I Again, I'll show you some more pictures of it, but the firm, you know, we're going to position usually uh, the visions of the firm. And a lot of these corporate strategies we're talking about would fit mostly large companies. The smaller companies, a SWOT analysis is pretty good, but the grand matrix would be more for a larger company. And we're looking to take our different divisions and evaluate them on, you know, the competitive position, the, the, the uh, market the growth of the market and industry as you know annual growth and exceeds sales um you know would have we're looking for something where we get a better feel for the our place in the industry and where the industry is going in general <clears throat> so i guess the two biggest dimensions were here competitive position and industry growth so where where do we, here is the, uh, the four quadrants. So where do we fit? Is it a weak, do we have a weak competitive position or a strong competitive position? Strong means if we have a strong competitive position, we're number one or two in the industry. Is it slow sales growth or is it rapid sales growth? So however companies want to define this, you know, they could define sale, slow sales growth as anything under 5%. Rapid sales growth is anything greater than 10%. So depending on how these forces apply to your company or division is where you're going to land in these four quadrants and the um so if we look at firms that may be in quadrant one which is rapid growth and strong competitive position <coughs> excuse me so again these quadrant one these are, are a great position to be in so these are companies that we're going to concentrate on staying in this market, developing our products, uh, aggressively competing, because this is where we want to be. We want to be in quadrant one because it has, you know, rapid growth. Um, although the strong, comp you know, strong competitive position that we have is also helps us to leverage economies of scale, control over suppliers, control over distributions. So this is where eventually we want to be in quadrant number one. Now, quadrant two is we're getting there. It's it's a rapid growth market, but we're not as strongly of a competitor. So in this marketplace, you know, we may be up and coming. So the growth of the industry is what's key here. So we want to we want to keep an approach that's going to keep us uh, improving our competitiveness. So we want to figure out a better way to make the products, a better way to connect with customers through marketing. Uh, we want to, you know, develop new markets, get to new markets faster. We want to integrate our companies horizontally to control more retailers or more manufacturers. So Quadrant True, we're working to become a strong competitive position in the rapid growth market. Now, if we are in Quadrant um, Three, now it's, it's a competitive, we have a competitive position, but in a weak market. So here we may want to try to expand the company by doing joint ventures or buying uh, unrelated uh, product groups or diversifying you know doing something where um you know in quadrant i guess quadrant four is what i'm talking about here is you know it's very the competition is there and it's very strong but it's a slow growth industry so they're fighting even harder for every new sales dollar so it's a very much more difficult place to, to be in because of the competition um 
and we want to make sure that we have enough cash flow and that we have we want it, that we're still able to compete in that particular position. So then if we're in um, quadrant three, there's going to be again a slower growth industry and weak and, and we have a weaker competitive position. So we're not so it's sort of like, should we even be here? Should we divest and liquidate? We can't we're not the strongest competitor. It's a weak uh, market to begin with. What are we doing here? Either we have a plan to become a strong competitor <clears throat> or we should get out. So again, it's just all these matrices are just helping you understand your position, your place in the industry, your, your company's internal and external strengths to get a better position of to where your strategic fo focus needs to be pointed. So again, it's, these are great exercises for executives to work on together uh, with their management teams and other employees to just get a better, a better way of focusing and reshaping their uh, concepts. Uh, so again, I kind of jumped ahead with the quadrants on that one on that one scale. But again, quadrant one, we want to be in this market. We want to we want to be a big. We already are. It's a grow, strong growth market. We're already a strong competitor, so we need to make sure we maintain those positions here. Quadrant two is all all about staying in the competitive market and becoming a more competitive company. So you, you're weak competitively, but you want to move up and you want to change the approach change your, um, do something to stand out and become a much stronger competitor. Quadrant three, um, got to make some, you know, quick decisions of whether or not we want to stay in a market that's not doing well and in a competitive position where we're not the strongest. Quadrant four, quadrant four we're strong competitively, but again, it's another slow growth or, or negatively growth related industry that we may want to diversify. So this has been a quadrant that say companies like AT&T have existed in before where they would um, look to diversify by buying other companies. One point AT&T bought Warner Brothers before it liquidated it. And it's just trying to find a way out of quadrant four, make the best of the situation by trying to use the cash flow of quadrant four to be able to buy your, buy your way into a different industry with it which is going to be in a different quadrant okay now the quantitative strategic planning matrix sq i'm sorry qspm another acronym um now this is another type of matrix where we're trying to prioritize the list so we so something that we want to we want to we have all these great ideas for strategies so now how do we prioritize that list to, to you know uh, to see what's most attractive, what's most feasible. So it's, so this particular QS uh, PM is going to be um, another way of organizing our thoughts and trying to put together, you know, inputs from stage one and stage two to decide, you know, among the different strategies that were put together. So again, if we look at the matrix here, we want to, you know, develop a weight and then kind of put these <clears throat> into different strategies, say we have three strategies. So for each of these key factors, <clears throat> which strategy would they be related to and what's, what's the weight? So it's gonna, this list of key factors are gonna consist of course of key external and internal factors. Um, and then we're gonna list, these are gonna be our f feasible strategies, our top three strategies that we're gonna come up with. Um, and then, you know, we're going to, um, start to almost put check marks <clears throat> into these, into these spaces. So this is just going to be, again, another visual overlay of how to lay out this, this matrix. So the steps would be, you know, make a list of the key internal, uh, opportunities and threats, strengths and weaknesses. So this is basically these key factors. Make a list of the key factors, specifically uh, most influential to our industry. Then we assign weights for each internal factor. And as far as, you know, you know the weights are gonna be determining what's most um, important. So the weights are gonna add up to 100%. So you can break out 100% between and the the factor with the biggest influence will have the highest percentage weight. Okay. 
And then stage two, a matching. The matrices identify alternative strategies the organize, organization should implement. So, so basically we're trying to, and we're laying out these, matching up these strategies, we're gonna help the, you know, determine a score of each, each strategy in you know, the attractiveness. So we're gonna identify the values that indicate the relative attractiveness of each strategy uh, considered in a single uh, external and internal factor. And then we're gonna compute the total attractive scores, you know, by, um, the, you know, multiplying the weights in step two to the uh, attractive scores in step four, and then finally compute the sum uh, of these scores. Do I have, I was hoping here. So here's a completed matrix here. So you can see that we have the weights from, um, to add up to 100%. And then we have, we put in um, the attractive score and then we put in the um, total attractive scores here. Because when we multiply across, we get the total attractive score. Uh, and then, so this would be, uh, one strategy, this would be another strategy, and we just basically uh, kind of add these up to get a, let's see, a final result. And this, so the higher the result, the more attractive it would be to go with this strategy, which would be a larger store, build, buy new land and build new larger stores rather than fully renovate existing stores. So it's just, again, let me just back up here. Uh, it's looking to organize um, on paper a set of strategies to understand, you know, that we can simultaneously look at these strategies. We can put scores that are gonna to relate to these key factors, internal and external. Um, and this is something that any size company can adopt this, this basic matrix. Uh, so limitations, of course, it's judgment, you're really, you're using your best guess. You don't have these weights and these scores are all something you're coming up with. There's not a lot of factual support as to what the number should be. So you're kind of guessing. Hopefully it's an educated guess. Um, it's only gonna be as good as the information you have um, going into the matrix. So, so when you're building this matrix, it's only gonna be as good as how accurate and how relevant your key factors are how accurate you're weighting them, and then how accurate your scores are gonna be um, in your attractiveness scores uh, for each of the, each of the, this one only has two strategies. So here's your attractive scores, then multiplying them across, you get your total attractive score. So, you know, 0.10 times four is 0.4, adding up all your attractive scores at the bottom of your matrix once you've filled out all your key strengths and uh, factors, you get your total your total score, and this is basically the higher the score, this is makes more sense to use this strategy. So again, sometimes just the process of going through the, um, these, these different matrix uh, help just to, it may not provide the correct answer or may not provide all the answers, but at least you're organizing, you're thinking about your company, you're organizing ideas, you're writing your strategies down, and it's giving you a place to start. Wherever you end up might be vastly different, but at least this is a way to start a conversation, get executives together, get them start talking, making lists of things that are important to the company. And it's a good way to make sure you're not missing anything because you have so many people talking about it, organizing it. And companies usually do more than one matrix. They don't stick to just one matrix. They might do two or three simultaneously and see if there's any um, trends between them. Um, so again, this uh, QSPM is helping helping you to decide between different strategies. Uh, and then the, of course, you always have to, there's other factors to, to figure out as far as, as money. Do you have the money to do these strategies, to implement these strategies? You know, so sometimes you may not be able to pick what you feel is the best strategy because you just don't have enough money um, to really get there. Now the culture and the political strategies of choice. Um, so strategies that require a few cultural changes may be more attractive because you're keeping the culture and you're really just changing things that are easier to change. 
even though my, you know, because changing culture is one of the hardest things to change at the company. Um, the political maneuvering to get <clears throat> your strategies of doubt, um, adopted to, um, you know, you're just going to have a big uphill battle unless you have strong leadership at the top to really, um, you know, change the political landscape of your company. And the political biases and personal preferences make it really difficult to always decide on the proper strategy for the company. And it's part of this selfishness of like, this is my idea and I want to champion my idea and your idea is clearly better, but I want to defend my idea because this is, I'm going to get credit for my idea. I'm not going to get credit for your idea. It's sort of some of the nonsense that goes on behind the scenes. So even though you have all the logical um, <clears throat> concepts and you, you have all the correct inputs and you've done all the matrix, sometimes the best strategies are not adopted or the best decisions are not adopted because of this you know, toxic culture or to toxic political positioning that different executives have in a company uh, that could prevent the company from making the proper decisions based on egos, based on, you know, people just feeling like they need to um, champion their idea and rally support around their idea. So sometimes the right idea doesn't have enough support or the right support to, to be implemented by the company. And so more successful successful companies have less of a toxic ego driven culture where it's really let's just do what's best for the company it doesn't matter if it's your idea or my idea we're moving forward with what would work best for the company and more toxic or poor companies will shun ideas from from lower level employees or push down employees are becoming too successful they may want to start to push them away because they could challenge their job or take over their leadership. So it's just really s small minds, you know, and, and short sightedness that are preventing the company from doing what it needs to do, which is to maximize shareholders wealth. Okay, so that's the end of chapter six, I hope you enjoyed this chapter, I look forward to talking to you in chapter seven, we're going to talk more about actually implementing these strategies, uh, and specifically with the marketing and, and management issues related to it. I'll talk to you then take care.